we were both starting to do hairdressing and uh, Colette and I were so excited because we were going to go to college together. Um, she was working in one salon and I was going to work in the other. Why Colette? She's beautiful Colette. Why her? If you like village life, then Keyworth was an ideal place to live. Picturesque, low crime rate, just a lovely, rural, idyllic place to be. Keyworth is a lovely village. It was where I grew up. I, I, you know, it's a beautiful village. And in the 80s, when we were growing up, it was um, one of the safest places. You just went everywhere and did your own thing. And um, a lot of people know each other, um, friendly, and just a lovely place to grow up. Walking everywhere was never an issue. Um, you know, you would go anywhere and everywhere by foot and felt comfortable doing so. Colette had, had gone to, to meet her boyfriend. He was going to meet her up Nicker Hill. Um, again, a beautiful place in Geeworth where you wouldn't think anything of walking. Colette didn't arrive at her boyfriend's and soon afterwards the alarm went up. Colette's missing. Something's very, very wrong. Paul Hutchinson seemed like a completely normal man next door. He was married, he had children, he had a normal job. There was nothing that made him stand out as abnormal or out of the ordinary. But deep down in the dark recesses, he lives a very, very different life. Unbeknown to everybody, and that's a very dangerous thing. He wasn't just an ordinary man living an ordinary life. He was somebody who was split, knew that he needed to protect one life to maintain the other life. In his spare time, he liked to hide out in sheds, watching young girls riding horses while touching himself. Sometimes people like Hutchinson make a very good job of hiding their sexual fantasies. There will always be some people who will recognise perhaps that strange behaviours. And sometimes within families, it, it depends how, how much questioning there is. He might have been able to live quite a private life in his own home. As a detective, you dread hearing those words, a child has gone missing. Detectives are parents themselves, but they have to suppress all the natural concerns that they might have because they've got a job to do. We've got to find this child. Colette was abducted from a country lane. She was bundled into a car. Um, she was strangled and her body was dumped in a field. When Colette's parents bid her farewell that evening, they wouldn't have dreamt for a moment that such an appalling thing was going to happen to her. Only about 20 minutes or so after the murder, Paul Hutchinson went to a pub. Where he sat and ordered a ploughman's, had a chat with the landlady and drank an orange juice and lemonade. The barmaid that served him was alarmed by his demeanour. He seemed a bit strange. She really thought something was wrong. Hutchinson used the toilet and he dried his hands on a paper towel which he put in the bin. The landlady called police saying, there was this guy in here and I did notice some blood on his hands. They went to the pub. And they retrieved some items including a paper towel. One very, very astute detective seized the paper towel that Hutchinson had used. The following day, about a mile and a half from the route that she'd followed, Colette's body was found. Colette's brother had to suffer the horror of finding 
his own sister dead. The biggest mistake Paul Hutchinson made was that he didn't have a crystal ball. He couldn't anticipate the advances in forensic science that would bring about his undoing. I'm sure Hutchinson was enjoying some kind of weird and perverted adrenaline rush not long after the murder. He was probably trying to constrain himself from telling somebody about what he'd done. This for him was the pinnacle of his very sad life. Hutchinson decided that he'd taunt the police, so he wrote them a letter saying words to the effect that you can't catch me. But he was making mistakes that unfortunately wouldn't be discovered for a long, long time. Now back in the 80s, there was no DNA analysis of exhibits. That science just didn't exist. Basically, it was fingerprints and very little else. Once fingerprinting had been invented, you needed large amounts of biological specimens to actually be able to generate a DNA profile. If the same crime happened today, one of the obvious first things police would have been able to do was retrieve DNA from Colette's body, from maybe from underneath her fingernails. They'd be able to look at the fibres on her body. They'd be able to maybe look at DNA found on her clothes. Those tools just didn't exist back in 1983. No CCTV. No automatic number plate recognition cameras. No mobile phones and all the evidence that they can give. And forensic science was really in its infancy. If you got a fingerprint, you were a very lucky detective. That detective had the wherewithal to seize that exhibit, the significance of which wouldn't be realised for over a quarter of a century. Depending on his kind of personality profile, depending if he was somewhere on, on the spectrum of, of psychopathy, very often those people do become very good liars because they become very manipulative. If you tell a really big lie, that is your cover. Somebody who routinely lied anyway, he, he certainly presents it as that kind of person. Lots of people were getting questioned and interviewed. Hutchinson was alarmed by this, so he concocted a story which he told to his family that he'd got cancer and that he had to go away for treatment. This story was so elaborate that he actually pulled tufts of his own hair out to convince people that those were the effects of the cancer treatment. As the initial heat from the inquiry died down, Hutchinson sort of reintegrated himself into society. He kind of went off radar for a bit and he started a new life. He had more children, including a son called Jean-Paul. He worked as an electrician, a salesman. He even served as a school governor. By the time 2008 came round, Forensic science had leapt forward enormously. Some of the exhibits from Colette's case had been examined and DNA profiles had been obtained. Every person that was arrested was now being swabbed as a matter of routine. One such person got arrested for a driving offence, taken to the police station and was swabbed. His days were numbered. The turning point in this case comes when Hutchinson's son, Jean-Paul, is pulled over for a speeding offence and arrested. A DNA profile is taken, and then they generate this partial hit. Jean-Paul's DNA matches the crime scene DNA profile, not entirely, but enough that that makes them think, hmm, maybe this person is related to the killer. There was a match then to Colette's murder and it was only a matter of time before he got the knock on the door. Once you've identified that somebody may be a relative of the person who committed the crime, 
There are other tests, other DNA tests you can do. One of them is Y chromosome testing. The Y chromosome is what males carry. And that Y chromosome is important because a copy of it has passed down the male line. So when Jean-Paul's Y chromosome is tested, they can then look at other male relatives and get a stronger idea of whether this person really is related or not. The police arrested Hutchinson and he spun a yarn. He said the DNA profile that they'd got actually belonged to his brother who was dead, so he was trying to put the blame on him. What he doesn't realise is that the police have his dead brother's DNA and it's not a match. So that blew a hole in Hutchinson's story. And there was a fingerprint on the letter that Hutchinson wrote to the police all those years ago. 26 years after the crime, Paul Hutchinson was sentenced to life imprisonment. Annoyingly, he only served a few months of that sentence. He took his own life. I always get extremely irritated by murderers who are allowed to take their own lives in prison. Hutchinson evaded justice while he was alive. He has now been able to evade justice through his death. <laughs>